everyone. How it's, how's it going? This is the book peddler out of Smithville Flats, New York. And I decided to do my uh, first book review. This is going to be a uh, purely audio review. And I'm putting up pictures of the book and pictures throughout the book. And um, yeah, I decided I'd, I'd give this a shot, take a crack at it. Um, this book I found in the very first pick that I did where I got in about right around 15,000 books at once in a storage unit and purchased them all. And I put this one aside because it looked very interesting and I finally got around to reading it and it was an excellent book. Um, I would highly recommend it. it. The title is Inclined to Escape by Yuri Vetokin, um, published in 1989. What's really co cool is my copy signed. And I believe Yuri is actually still alive, and he's about 90 years old, and he lives in San Diego, if I'm not mistaken. Um, maybe uh, at some point I'll try to reach out and contact him, um, but who knows, you know. So anyhow, um, so this, this book is Yuri's personal account of daily life under the repressive uh, communist regime of the Soviet Union after World War II, as well as his experience of being locked away in a Soviet concentration camp and tortured for nine years as a political dissident, all because he tried to defect from Russia. Eventually, he does successfully defect. It's kind of obvious, or the book wouldn't exist. And uh, I was completely drawn in by his account. I couldn't put it down. I read it in like two and a half days wasn't wordy or overly saturated, read smooth, had a great flow to it. Um, the book was horrifying and disturbing to read. Obviously, when he was in the Soviet concentration camps, it was, but also daily life was as well. And I'll speak on both aspects of it. Um, to me, it was a miracle that he wasn't completely mentally damaged by daily toxic inject injections and torture for years on end. He exhibited extreme mental discipline and fortitude, focusing his energy on staying alive and planning his escape. His faith in God and strong will helped to maintain some semblance of sanity when most would succumb to defeat. Yuri was declared clinically paranoid and insane by the Soviet doctors because he tried to leave the country. He made a makeshift raft and tried to escape across the Black Sea into Turkey. He used the cover of darkness to try and avoid detection of the Soviet patrols but failed. Years of planning were crushed. Yuri was in no way insane. He was a formal naval officer, a highly intelligent and publicized computer engineer, an inventor, a literary aficionado. He wrote and recited poetry, played chess. He did not drink nor get involved in, all, in the all-encompassing black market that exists in all communist countries, where supplies are scarce, and in order to survive, many have to turn to crime to make ends meet. Where the state controls the economy and the pay of individuals, even as a high-level computer engineer, he wasn't making enough. He was literally living in a kitchen for years on end. His credentials, conduct, principles, etc. were not of an insane man whatsoever. They were ones of an intelligent man that wanted better for himself. The system he grew up in compelled the people into, into conformity through great fear and manipulation. Yuri saw through the deceptions. Many most likely did as well, but you don't survive by talking about them. Out of fear, people kept quiet and towed the party line to survive. It was apparent by reading the book that everyone seemed to live in a very paranoid existence. No one trusted each other, not husband nor wife, children nor neighbors. All were encouraged to report on each other if anti-Soviet remarks were uttered. The Soviets would even plant agents in the prisons and in society in general to extract information. Nobody ever really knew who they were talking to nor their motives. The communists is complete control over the political, societal, and economic mechanisms of society kept the people with their eyes to the ground and hearts and minds shackled in bondage. Everyone was a suspect in this system that feeds on its own. In reading Yuri's experiences of daily life, it was apparent that in order to survive under the, this repressive regime, one would have to pretend or try to convince oneself that their current physical and mental state was that of a pleasant existence, or at least it would help if you did maintain that type of attitude. 
if somehow your mind broke through the conditioning and indoctrination fed to you by the state, it would be beneficial for survival purposes to train yourself to accept the circumstances you are in. The personas exhibited by the majority of people Yuri writes about in the book seem disingenuous and shifty. You couldn't have an authentic conversation with anyone, it seemed, nor share inner thoughts. People avoided them and acted as if everything was fine when it clearly wasn't. So I kind of thought of an example to illustrate better my observation of what he was writing about. And I hope it's, uh, I hope it's sufficient enough in conveying to you the general population's outlook, which to me was one of uh, defeat and despair compared to Yuri's outlook. So the example was kind of uh, someone who, who doesn't have a pair of shoes and is given an old leather pair. And the shoes are too small. They're inadequate. You just have to stuff your feet in them. They have little nails that maybe poke at you. Um, they prick your foot when you walk. And so the Soviet-minded person accepts this discomfort given to them by the state. Um, they have their shoes. They act overly exuberant. Um, granted, it's great that they have a pair of shoes and their feet are protected um, for the time being. Of course, as time progresses, it will destroy your feet, but they act happy and uh, they accept it for what it is. Now, Yuri's attitude is more something along the lines of, yeah, he accepts the free handout, but he's not impressed with the conditions of the shoes. And he wants a better pair. He wants them to fit comfortably. Because um, in the long run, those shoes are going to mangle up his foot and cause, cause damage. So he's not comfortable nor satisfied with accepting the status quo and what is given to him. He wants better and doesn't act like everything's all right just because he has his shoes. Um, unfortunately, in the Soviet system that he was living in, you get what you get and you're not allowed to strive better. For, for better. People were trained on learning to love their servitude to the state. So for Yuri, in order to survive daily life in general, he had to quiet his restless mind, um, lock his inner thoughts away. If he didn't, it would only be a matter of time before he would have been ratted on and found out. So like the, the free shoes, just accept them, shut your mouth, keep your thoughts about them to yourself, and get along. Okay, get along with it. Um, there were a few exceptions, however, where he had some room, although limited, to engage in dangerous discourse. In the general population, it was with fellow writers and poets. In the prisons and mental wards, it would be with other labeled political dissidents. Uh, still, there was always risk involved. I'll talk a little more about Yuri's observations on the general public and the operation of the communist system as a whole towards the end of this review when he's released from the mental ward. Um, what was clear was during his sentencing, after his failed escape, was that the court system was set up so that no one could truly be able to defend oneself. Anything the Soviet Russian government may have publicly signed on the world stage, such as international human rights treaties, for instance, was all for show, it was never abided by. One had no ability to defend oneself and when you are eventually locked away, your natural rights are obliterated. You have no control over what happens to you. And it doesn't matter if you don't consent to be injected with chemicals or was somehow ruled in your favor not to receive them. You are going to receive them anyways. Likewise, in general society, your natural rights are not recognized as well. You can be taken away by so-called anti-government uttering, locked into a black hole, never to be heard of again. Uh, defense of oneself is truly not an option in this system. So Yuri's inquisitors were some of the most vicious, psychotic personalities encountered in the book. It was kind of hair-raising. Um, they knew he wasn't insane, and they relished in locking him in a mental ward. The nurses as well were completely perverse and demented. They all got off on having unrestrained power and dominance over others. Uh, to me, beauty to this type of person was hearing someone beg for their life. They relished in the pain of others, enjoyed seeing someone slowly break down physically and mentally. Beauty to them was seeing someone being strapped down on a table against their will, 
and slowly, methodically moving toward them with a needle. The victim's eyes widen and strain in horror. The nurse's thin lip smile spreads across their face, softly explaining to the victim that they are helping them. It's like watching a horror movie. The victim convulses and chokes on their own vomit and snot before they pass out as another round of sulfur is pumped into their veins. You're tossed back into a cell filled with legitimate psychotics and criminals. Laying down on a filthy stained cot, your heart, your, your strained heart struggles. Cold sweat envelops you and your body shakes and convulses. Not being able to go to the bathroom, nor in many cases physically able to ask to go, you piss yourself and pray it goes unnoticed. If a guard were to notice, you would be held down and beaten. Eating was a struggle as well. Sometimes you just couldn't stomach food after injections. Stomaching it without injections was tough on its own. Soup had worms in it. The cod was rotten. The only salvation was if you had an outside source that could send you some food. Usually this was the wealthy inmates that had the ability to obtain better food. In either case, if you did not eat, the guards would shove a tube down your throat and pump food into your stomach. It, it was a disgusting show filled with sadistic personalities. Um, Yuri would be injected a countless number of times with toxic chemicals, be it insulin, sulfur, aminazine, or a cocktail of swords. The nurses tried to kill the man's spirit. They wanted him to confess about his escape and how he was able to get so far, as well as rat and others that may have helped him in his failed efforts. Sometimes they would induce him with an agent, a type of truth serum called Barbamil, to get him to talk. Fortunately, it did not have an effect on him. The nurses called the treatments, quote, reindoctrination by medication. They wanted him to confess that he was mentally ill and said he would be released. They constantly played games with his head. One thing that was interesting was that the guards, which were called orderlies, were actual convicted criminals, some for murder or theft. One guard in particular murdered his whole family. Of course, his case was a form of temporary, temporary insanity. Of course, he would have been full-blown insane if he tried to leave the country like Yuri. But they made sure the inmates were kept in line, the, the so-called mental patient inmates, and they would beat and torture them if they weren't. There was much corruption in the prison system and mental ward. It was definitely a reflection of life on the outside. It, that was uh, that was being uh, the inside was a reflection on the outside. So, so here's a quote: "The corruption which gnaws away at the entire Soviet governmental machinery is more blatant in the prisons than anywhere else. Every service in the special prison had to be paid for." If you wanted to go to the toilet, you had to give the orderly a tin of canned food. If you wanted to smoke, the same thing. Those who had nothing found life a hundred times harder in a Soviet prison than those who had money and food items. So the orderlies all stayed in the separate barracks, where they had radio, better food, and more general freedoms within the walls than the so-called mentally ill patients. After a few years, when the nurses were off duty, sometimes he would be let in the orderlies' quarters, and he would play chess and listen to the radio. This only temporarily would improve how he was treated by some of the guards. Everyone knew about 20% or better of the inmates in the psych concentration camp were not mentally ill. It did not matter, however, when orders were given or you made an orderly mad for a minor offense, you were dealt with brutally. What was amazing to me was how some who were in Yuri's prison for being labeled political dissidents, still adamantly professed their support for the Soviet communist regime. They seemed to suffer from a learned helplessness or a form of Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, both are psychological terms. Um, it's kind of where they grew to love their tormentors and abusers. Um, regardless, the political dissenters were always the ones that received the harshest punishments and were the most medicated. Their stays were always the longest. Yuri, however, continued to flesh out and escape during this time. In one part of the book, Yuri tells of how the nurses continued to tell him that they are curing him and keep telling him that he is in a hospital and not a concentration camp. Yuri retorts by saying, You're curing me in the same way the American bombers are curing the North Vietnamese communists. After this statement, the injections increased and he ended up having a heart attack. Yuri would periodically be called in for evaluations. And after his last comment to the nurses on their treatments to cure Yuri, he was severely tortured for another year until his next evaluation. 
Yuri maintains he is in no way mentally ill, which brings a rage upon the head nurse. As she says, quote, Yuri Alexandrovich, you're not surrendering to the treatment. You've already received a great deal of medication, but you talk and think as you used to. We not only require that you begin talking differently, but also that you think differently. You must like what you used to hate and hate what you used to like. You have to change your personality. Until you change your personality, you won't be released from the special hospital. This is an amazing part of the book. Um, really shows the underpinnings of these people's mindsets. They knew this guy was in no way insane, and they're trying to force him into believing he, he was basically admitting he was, but they could not convince him. Uh, treatment continued on for, for Yuri. He'd hide the pills he was supposed to be taking. Of course, if caught, he'd be punished. Injections would start up again, and he'd be beaten on. But sometimes the nurse would overlook it. Um, he counted in six months of hiding pills that he spat out 16,410. That's amazing. I believe that equates to something like 10 pills a day. My math isn't good, but um, incredible number there. Uh, Yuri writes about the doctors as a whole after witnessing a murder by a nurse, which I'll, I'll paraphrase. Quote, officially they are called doctors and nurses, and when they are called executioners, they are offended. Outwardly, they do not look like executioners. Outwardly, they look like everyone else. They dress the same, some tastefully and elegantly, and others less so. They have the same concerns as other people, their home, children, retirement. They even have the same passions, love, and jealousy. They love flowers. Bokovskaya, let me see, Bok. Kovskaya, which is one of the doctors, has fresh flowers on her desk year-round. They all have clean, sometimes even scented hands. Their hands are never smeared with blood, as we usually imagine executioners. Who are they, really? Ordinary people or contrary? Demons? But if they are demons, how did they get to be this way and where do they come from? How are the communists able to find such people who make torture and murder their daily work? Another question. Is it possible that they are not culpable? Is it possible that when the hour comes, they will not be held responsible because they were only carrying out someone else's orders? It seems to me that all of them have already justified it to themselves. This in addition to the false documents and identities which the KGB has provided them in peacetime. Throughout his time, there were many patient suicides. The ones who weren't successful wished they had been as they would be either physically beaten to death or combinations of beatings and chemical treatments. No mercy was shown for the elderly either. Yuri one year tried to celebrate Christmas. Big mistake. On came another relentless spree of injections, this time Haloperidol. Yuri eventually had broken down physically to such an extent he felt like he would surely die if another year of medical torture proceeded. Before his arrest, he kept journals of his experience of daily life in the Soviet Union, one day wanting to share with the world his story. He had destroyed it twice for fear of being caught. When he was arrested and put in prison, he maintained his dream of freedom and having his story published for the world to read. At his next evaluation, he decided to admit to the doctors that he was insane and indeed tried to escape so that he didn't die from, from another year of mass injections and hoped that it would eventually grant his freedom by playing ball with the doctors. It was a risk worth taking. After six months, they finally released him. Afterwards, when he is trying to get readjusted to life on the outside, he takes on a job as a cafeteria worker. Wages are so low, he is barely able to live, but he was able to sustain himself from the rations given to him by the cafeteria. Another point of interest that Yuri points out is that the quality and quantity of rations is solely based on one's position in society. The rations he was given were privileges. The wage set by the state did not provide much in terms of sustenance. No one will work for such a low rate wage, so the communists implemented the policy of giving workers free meals. However, it was not the government that was paying for these free meals and rations. It was at the expense of the cafeteria's customers that came in to buy the food. The customers' portions were reduced, and they would not get what they paid for. 
as the food they should have gotten was rationed out to cafeteria workers or sold on the side by whoever was in charge for extra cash. Quote, similar rations exist in USSR for all categories of workers from the top down. And in every case, they are not paid for by the government, but by the people. Very often, these rations are called privileges. The system itself is a system of privileges. Privileges are worth seven times more than wages. To try and make ends meet, Yuri would forge wild mushrooms and he'd bring them to market. He reveals the general outlook and attitude fellow Russians had towards life and general living in such a repressive society. He illustrates this with, with his experience in the woods, foraging mushrooms, and how the forests were treated by the people. Quote, they took away as much as they needed and left the rest to rot. They could have cared less. The forest isn't mine, it's the government's. Soviet people live as though there were no tomorrow. They are used to the fact that nothing belongs to them personally, since everything belongs to the government, that is, to the communists. So people have developed a devil-may-care attitude toward everything, including nature. They make a mess everywhere. Leaf fires burning, chop down and destroy trees, pluck mushrooms out by the roots, ruin berry fields, gathering berries with combines, end quote. Forests were being decimated, no one seemed to care. They only live for today, never for tomorrow. Their attitude was one of nihilism, cynicism, defeat, and helplessness. It was, this was a desolate condition. Yuri eventually escapes by way of a cruise ship. After years of planning and saving his money to attempt another escape, he ends up jumping through a porthole of, a ship he, of the ship he was on and sw swims 25 miles for 20 hours in shark-infested waters to an Indonesian island, which was, again, another horrifying experience. And uh, absolutely incredible this man survived it. Um, so he successfully defected, and he wrote this book, for all to know about the inner goings on, the behind the scenes look of, of how uh, Soviet Russia was run by the communists. And uh, I highly recommend the book. It kept me enthralled. I couldn't put it down. In my admiration for Yuri, obviously it goes without saying, um, as well as for other individuals throughout the book in which he, he shares their story through his it's such an amazing inside look at, at uh, communist society, how people conduct themselves, the social, the social attitudes, and how it functioned. Um, it was a, it was powerful in a page turner. Uh, the last handful of pages of this book is basically his warning to the West of how this system grew, and could easily infiltrate and subvert a Western country through social, cultural, and political means. It was a direct warning not to let our country be taken over by, by uh, this type of philosophy where freedom and natural rights cease to exist. Uh, and government takes over the private sectors and controls the economy and daily life, uh, basically. You're compelled to abide. Um, freedom of thought is denied. And the people as a whole are turned into hollow, paranoid beings without much to live for. The, the uh, religion is the state. It's state worship. There's no room for, for anything else but state worship. Um, and, and one guy that I would really recommend, uh, if, after, if anyone has interest in checking out this book, is there is an interview with a man named Yuri Bezmenov. Um, uh, Y-U-R-I B-E-S M-E-N Bezmenov, OF, I believe, Yuri Bezmenov, and he was a, a defector, and he was a very high-level defector, and a man named G. Edward uh, Griffin interviews him on YouTube, and he was stationed in India on behalf of the, uh, the Soviet Union, and his job was to culturally destroy that, that people over in India. Um, and it is amazing, but he falls in love basically with the with the Indian uh, people and their culture, and um, basically has a uh, has his thoughts revised about what he's doing. It's like a come to God moment. But um, he he Griffin does this interview with him, who is a very uh, uh, wonderful scholar 
and notable author. And it's a very powerful interview. And I, I highly recommend everyone to listen to that as well, as well as read uh, this book, Inclined to Escape. And um, anyhow, this is my first book review. I'll do others. Sometimes I'll do them live. This one I was more comfortable doing audio, and I hope it comes out fairly decent. And uh, I, I thank everyone for listening. Please like and subscribe to the, to the YouTube page. I will tr be putting out um, more book reviews as they come along. And uh, I hope you found it interesting and beneficial. Please hit the like button uh, and stay tuned in for more reviews on other books to come. All right. We'll see you.